This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Performance measurement largely makes use of quantified data, in other words, numerical data. And this chapter uh, deals with ways in which we have to be careful uh, either with presenting that numerical data or interpreting that numerical data because the data could be used uh, to mislead us either innocently or more deliberately. So I'll just quickly go down this uh, list with a few illustrations of uh, how we might be uh, misled. And first of all, uh, there is the choice of the data to measure and to disclose to people. Easy way of concealing uh, bad information is simply not to publish it or to publish it uh, in a, a way or under a heading which is perhaps deliberately um, uh, dece deceitful. Now in the uh, uh, COVID epidemic, uh, which we've all uh, presumably been aware of, uh, in the UK the, the government uh, produced statistics uh, really every day uh, and in particular uh, it was looking at the number of new infections, it was looking at the number of deaths and it said uh, also about the number of people in hospital with Covid. Now what, uh, now obviously you, you can't you know, if somebody dies, they die, but there were, there were time, time delays, uh, partially uh, through collecting information about the number of people dying throughout a, a you know, a, a large population and so on. But I want to talk about uh, particularly the, the number of people uh, who were described as being in hospital with COVID. Uh, because in the UK, a great emphasis was placed on uh, trying not to uh, overwhelm our health service. And what became obvious really quite far into the epidemic is that number uh, was taking into account all people in hospital with COVID, which is not the same as people in hospital because of COVID. So if someone had had a motorcycle accident and broke the leg and taken into hospital to have the, the, the leg uh, fixed up, they'd be given a COVID test, uh, and if they were uh, uh, testing positive, they'd be included in that number of people in hospital with COVID. Now, it's not untrue, it's not inaccurate, they are in hospital and they do have COVID, uh, but is it particularly what people thought was meant by that statistic? And many people assumed by that statistic that what the government was telling them these are the number of people who've got COVID and have had to be taken off to hospital to save them or to try to save them from COVID. And the strong suspicion is that the government and perhaps elements of the health service were trying to overstate, uh, were perhaps trying to frighten the population somewhat uh, into taking the, um, the outbreak of COVID, the epidemic, uh, more seriously uh, uh, more than they might otherwise have done so. Secondly, sampling. A lot of statistics depends on sampling, simply because it's too uh, time consuming and too expensive to ask everyone's opinion. And you can see results like, you know, 70% of uh, the, the sample said that they like option A, 30% they said they like option B. Now that of itself means very, very little. Uh, you need to know the size of the sample. If it was that you simply uh, looked at 10 people and seven liked it, three didn't like it, then it, it's, you, you, you can tell inherently it's not going to be very reliable. And we need to be told what the confidence level is, like 95%, or the con confidence interval is, like plus or minus 10%. And we need to know how many people were in the sample, because the more in the sample, the better the sample, the, the, the conclusions drawn are going to be, the more reliable they're going to be. 
So we need to make sure it's free of bias. Uh, we uh, the, the, these can only be uh, extrapolated from a sample to saying something about a population if we're sure that the sample is free of bias. In other words, every member of the population has an equal chance of being chosen for the sample. We need to know the size of the sample. We need to know the confidence level. We know that we need to know the confidence interval. Without those other parts of the statistical process, uh, just saying 70% prefer this is of hardly any use. Small samples, you need to be very wary of these. Uh, let's say you had a population where we know that 50% prefer option A, 50% prefer option B, and you want to produce some sort of report which greatly prefers option A. So you go out and you take a sample of 10. Now the chances of, of it exactly being 5, 5 are quite small. You wouldn't be surprised if it's 6, 4, even 7, 3 in that small sample. But the problem is taking a, a sample of 10 is very quick and cheap to do. And if you don't like the 50-50 answer, which we know is kind of the right answer because we know it reflects the, the population as a whole, or I'm assuming it does, we'll do it again. If you do it often enough, you'll soon get to a, a, a sample result which gives you 80-20. And then you can present people with this, oh, 80-20, that's overwhelming uh, support for option A. So small samples are very, very dangerous, very uh, susceptible to manipulation, and they can give the appearance of a pattern where none exists. In other words, if you just scatter five points randomly over a piece of graph paper, quite often they will appear to go on a line where, when really that's just random. If you were to, to scatter 10,000 points over a piece of graph paper, then you get an almost even distribution and there'd be no discernible pattern whatsoever. Averages. Beware of arithmetic means. That's where you add up everything, divide by the number of items in the sample, or need the population. Uh, once you put in an extreme value, then it greatly distorts the mean. So if you had uh, three results, five, 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 average is obviously five. But if you put in five, 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 25, then we're getting up to 40, and the average is going to be 10. So we've doubled from 5 to 10 uh, just by putting in a very high value. Uh, and if you wanted to say, well, we've increased people's wages, these people have got 5, 5, 5, uh, all you do is employ somebody else at 40. These people are still getting 5, 5, 5, but the average is whizzed up uh, to or, or putting in uh, 30, 25, 35, whatever it was, but the average is kind of whizzed up and doubled just by one person. Relative and absolute risks. Sometimes we, we see, uh, particularly medical statistics, you know, if you do this, uh, your risk of dying is doubled. Or your, your risk of dying because of this food or, or, or this bad habit which you have, or, or whatever it's going to be, is doubled. But, which sounds very alarming. Uh, but what happens if uh, your risk of dying from that you know, sporting pursuit or pastime or food or, or whatever you're doing, what happens if the risk was only 1 in 10 million anyway? True, it's gone up now to 1 in 5 million, but it doesn't seem to be, to be quite as alarming as saying, well, your risk has doubled. So before we can really make much of a judgment as to whether or not we would be happy uh, to, to bear that change, to bear that risk, uh, we really need to know uh, what the absolute risk is, uh, as well as the relative risk. False positives and negatives, so there's, there's quite a long uh, example in the notes uh, about that. Uh, basically, what it is saying is if you have uh, a disease which occurs in only 1% of the population. 99% of the population isn't getting it. If you have a diagnostic test which gets the some of the 99% wrong, uh, that's going to be potentially getting 
quite a lot of the 99% well people included in the unwell uh, part of the population. And it can be extremely alarming. These false positives, as they're called, uh, uh, can, can uh, really be le leading you to, to, to make very, very scary predictions indeed. And it's worth just working through, uh, or having a look at the example in the, the notes just to see, to see that. Correlation. Uh, almost certainly you know about, uh, uh, or you should know about correlation. Correlation is, uh, where uh, typically you take three readings, maybe cost and output. Uh, you, you, you try to see is the relationship between cost and output. Uh, and then you say, you try to make predictions, uh, from, from that. And, uh, the, if correlation is high, if correlation is one, it means that you can make very, very good predictions about, uh, the cost of output in the future. But remember that correlation does not prove causation. Just because two items are well correlated, uh, doesn't mean that one causes the other. And the, the classic, uh, kind of example, which is given, if, if you were to, uh, graph out, I think I can do this in the next page here. If you were to graph out here, the consumption of ice cream and the, uh, the number of people who need uh, rescued, from the sea, then, uh, you know, you could argue and get a line something like that, which is showing good positive correlation. But it does not prove that eating ice creams it means you're going to you know, get into swimming difficulties or sailing difficulties or something like that. All it means is that in good weather, uh, people consume more ice creams and more people go to the sea and there are going to be more cases of difficulty. So we have to be really careful uh, about this. You get it a lot in, in kind of medical uh, uh, investigations. Uh, because you eat this, it causes that disease. And, and that may not be it at all. It might be because of that disease, you crave more of that. It may be completely independent uh, in, in, indeed. Uh, so they might. Next. Correlation, graphs without scales, or scales not starting at zero. And then we put graph scales in here, kind of twice. A, a very, very easy way of misleading people. You get it sometimes in share prices. You get it in company profits. But if you have uh, something like this showing a share price or an exchange rate, and it kind of goes like this, uh, uh, as, let's say the share price during the day, uh, they say, oh my goodness, it's going up and down, or, or, or the exchange rate is going up and down against time here. But what happens if, you know, down here, uh, the share price is $5, and up here, uh, the share price is 5.2? And, and really, uh, you know, rather than the share price going up and down massively and worrying everybody that a share is collapsing or something else is going on here, it, it's almost a, a little random effect which is going on there. It's much more, if, I want to say, it would, this would be a much more important kind of variation kind of graph uh, if not only did we put this between five and seven, now there it is obviously going up and down much more. But if you had it kind of going between naught and 10, say, once you get the naught in there, you're, you're getting an idea of almost the relative importance of the change which is going on. If you get rid of the zero in the graph, and you're only going here between 5 and 7 or 5 and 6, or whatever it's going to be, uh, you're, you're getting the the kind of absolute change, but you're not getting a very good idea, maybe, of the relative change which is going on. In other words, what I'm, what I'm trying to say, I think, is, is if we, you know, if we look at the kind of changes like this, you don't know whether that's important or not. But if you put zero in here and you put a hundred in there, 
you're getting a better idea. Or if the scale there is one, you're getting a better idea as well. So beware graphs without scales, and beware graphs which do not start at zero, uh, because the, the graph will seem to be ex extremely volatile. But it may only be going between 5 and 5.2, and it's uh, much less impressive.